Amen. Please be seated. Service in the name of Jesus Christ. I think it's still Mother's Day, isn't it? Mother's Day lasts all day, doesn't it? So happy Mother's Day, mothers, if I've missed anybody. Um, we have uh, uh, this Wednesday Bible study at 7 o'clock, and it's a beautiful time to gather people. It's a lovely time to sing some hymns together, have some uh, time of prayer and fellowship. When you have a smaller group, the fellowship seems to be warmer, so please don't miss out on that opportunity on Wednesday nights. Friday, 4.30, is the Kids Club from ground level up to uh, primary school. Uh, 7 o'clock is the youth adults meeting and Arabic service is 7.30. Um, please uh, make sure you give George and Lydia a, a contact. Uh, just let them know how, how happy you are for them, for, little, for birth of little Verily Faye Eid. Sure, it's a wonderful blessing to them. All right, we're going to turn this evening to the book of Esther. Book of Esther. We're going to read just chapters two, chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. The book of Esther, chapter 2, verse 1 to 11. The topic tonight is victory through obedience. All right, verse 1. After these things, when the wrath of the king Ahasuerus was appeased, he remembered Vashti and what she had done, and what was decreed against her, then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, Let there be a fair, let there be fair young virgin sought for the king. Let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom, that they may gather together all the fair young virgins unto Shushan the palace, to the house of the women, unto the custody of Hege, the king's chamberlain, keeper of the women, and let their things be, of purification be given them. And let the maiden, which pleased the king, be queen instead of Vashti. The thing pleased the king, and he did so. Now in Chushan the palace, there was a certain Jew, Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jireh, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity, which had been carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And he brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful, who Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. So it came to pass, when the king's commandment and his decree was heard, and when many maidens were gathered together unto Shushan the palace, to the custody of Hegai, that Esther was brought also unto the king's house, to the custody of Hegai, keeper of the women. And the maiden pleased him, and she obtained kindness of him, and he speedily gave her her things for purification with such things as belonged to her. And seven maidens, which were meet to be given her, out of the king's house, and he preferred her and her maids unto the best of the place of the house of the women. Esther had not showed her people nor her kindred, for Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it. And Mordecai walked every day before the court of the women's house to know how Esther did and what become of her, what should become of her. Let's please bow for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for, again, this day where we have the opportunity of um, honouring the role of motherhood, which is a very, very important role today. And thank you, Father, for the dedication that these mothers give unto their duty to thee and to their family. Bless this time together as we have your word read and the message from it. Help us, Lord, to have hearts to hear and open to receive. For it's in Christ, let me ask, amen. So looking at victory through obedience. Esther is one of those books of the Bible that in my quiet time when I come to you, I think, oh, you beauty, Esther again. I love this little book. The certain passages seem to jump out. This one over here is comforting. So when I start it, I can't stop till I finish it. I don't care where I am, I've got to finish that little book. Beautiful, beautiful story of victory and of the wonderful courage of this, this woman who raised up from nothing to a high position of queen and who all her life had to suffer hardship. I mean, all her life, that was God's calling upon her, but who gained victory through hardship because of her faith. Now, Esther's a, a unique book in the sense that the name of God does not appear in this book anywhere. Some people try and work out some analogy somewhere where God, this, this could refer to God, that could refer to God, but his name's not there anywhere. And then uh, you find also there's no quotes about this book in the New Testament. 
You find there's no mention about the law of Moses, no sacrifice, no offering, no religious services, nothing. Because it's written in a pagan context in Persia. So obviously none of these things will happen. <clears throat> now in this passage we have Jews back in Persia. Now this was a no-no because God told Israel through Jeremiah, through Isaiah, that you'll be in, in uh, Babylon captive for seven years, after which come back to your land, build the temple, build the city again. Well, after 70 years in captivity, you kind of get comfortable. And God told them through Jeremiah, put your roots down, go get married, do your job, build your homes. They've done that. After 70 years, they're comfortable. They know the Babylonian language perfectly. They have business established. They've got families established. Why uproot and go back? Especially if you're born in Babylon, you've never seen Israel, you have no connection with the land over there, why go back? And then we find also, this time over here, you have another 54 years down the road. So these people here are comfortable, living in captivity, don't want to go back. So you find here, this book is written to these Jews over there. Let them know, very, very, very plainly let them know how God is ever present, even though there's no outward mention in their lives about God, he's ever present. Right throughout society, God is ever present. So we find over here that um, this little story is about this woman and she's the heroine. She's the absolute heroine. Her whole life was one of hardship. And by the way, when you look at her life, you see a parallel between her and Joseph. You know, Joseph was the saviour of his people from all the famine and the death because of famine. And, and Esther saved her people from a decree of death. Joseph was um, someone who was a prisoner, became governor. And you have fine Esther, an orphan, in captive, becomes a queen. Joseph, later on, was forced to marry a Gentile idol worshipper. Same thing with Esther. And Joseph, over here, is a person faithful right throughout his whole life, and he never, ever left his role as governor. Esther stuck with the role she had as queen for the rest of her life. Never left it. She was used by God in a great and mighty way not because of any upbringing she had, but because of the hardship she was called to endure and the circumstances she was called to accept. We don't govern the circumstances that God sends our way. We don't govern the hardships God sends our way. Some people are born to a home where there's just a mum and there's no dad. Some people are raised up in a home where mum and dad are split. Some are raised up in a home where there's a lot of fractions, a lot of problems, a lot of troubles, everything under the sun. Fine. We have a certain context. We come into this world. And God brings us here this way. Some people have a greater IQ than others, a greater ability to make money than others. Some people are, uh, in their appearances are more presentable than other people. Fine. Whatever the context is God brings us in, whatever hearts about the face, through obedience we can become conquerors. Obedience to Christ and his word. So firstly we're told over here, Esther was an orphan. In chapter 2, verses 5 to 7, and, uh, she was brought up by Mordecai, her, her, um, her cousin, and now Mordecai, if you look, look at this passage over here, he wasn't a young person. Now in chapter, in verse 5 it says, Now in Shushan the palace there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jai, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity, which had been carried away with Jeconiah. Now, if this carrying away refers to Mordecai, as the passage seems to imply, this guy's going to be over 100 years old. Because, you see, from the time of the carrying away of Jerusalem by, by, uh, Je by Jeconiah, they would have, they have 58 years until Babylon was conquered by Persia, another 54 years until this king comes around. And then three years into his reign, we find this passage is, is, um, is involved in. So 115 years after he was taken out of uh, Jerusalem into captivity, this passage occurs. Either he's a very, very, very old man, or they say, hold on, it might refer to Kish, his great-grandfather, who was taken into captivity at that particular time. Either way, he's not a young fella. Mordecai is not a young man. And you get a guy who's older, taking a girl who is younger, he has no conception of the generations he's living in, the way they feel he's past that. And so she has him raising her up completely. He's like an older, older parent. And we're told very plainly, she obeyed Mordecai in everything. Chapter 2, verse 20, we read, Esther had not yet showed her kindred and nor her people, as Mordecai had charged her for. Esther did the commandment of Mordecai, like as when she was brought up with him. Even as a queen later on, she obeyed him completely. 
She had learned very much to obey. And the Bible says, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother with the first commandment in promise, and uh, it shall be well with thee. So we find her very, very obedient. She was outwardly very beautiful, but still a maiden. No doubt, many people have put their eyes upon her and look at her, look at her still an absolute maiden, a faithful girl in a pagan world. That's very commendable. Then we find also, after this, Esther was taken captive. It seems that the king was displeased with his wife. He gave her a miss. He wanted to find an alternative. So his, his, his princess said, go and search out all, of the land, all the virgins in the land and pick which one you want. And so she was picked as being one of those possibilities to come unto him and to be his wife. Now, because she was very beautiful, she's a maiden, taken captive to the king's palace, and what before her was this? Twelve months of purification in her mind. I've got to spend a night with the king. You get a girl who is pure, you get a girl whose mind is pure with the Lord, that would be frightening. He's a person I don't know. He's a person who's a pagan. He doesn't know the Lord. And I'm supposed to go into him and be with him? It was not a welcome appearance. Twelve months, twelve months of thinking about it. Six months of purification with the oil of myrrh. Six months with the purification through sweet odours. Living a life of slavery with only one possible outcome. First, sorry, three possible outcomes. One, she'd never go home again. Because she was chosen, that's it. Never go home again. Either she become one of his concubines in his harem to come and to please his lustful attentions when, when he felt like it, or become the, the, the wife of a pagan king. The two things for a godly woman would not be very, very pleasing. Some commentators say, oh, wow, this is a wonderful chance for this girl to make in this world become a queen. If she was an ungodly person, sure. But she wasn't. She's a godly Jewish girl who followed the Lord, who was pure completely, a maiden, and absolutely, absolutely before God's eyes pure. Now, she obeyed Mordecai, concealed her race, and did not tell them who she was. Now, she might not have understood why, but it was in God's providence that she kept it all secret. Now, we find after this, she was chosen to become the wife of the Gentile king. Well, it can't be such a bad thing, you think. We stop and think. In chapter 1, verse 10 and 11, we find the Bible says... After six months of feasting and drunkenness, we find over here on the seventh day, this on the, he has another seven day of feast, when, they, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Muham and Bista, Harbona, Bigtha and Agabatha and Zetha and Carcass and seven chamberlains that served in the presence of King Ahasuerus to bring Vashti the queen before the king with the crown royal to show the people and the princess her beauty, for she was fair to look upon. This guy was drunk, wanted to call his wife down and parade her before all his drunken friends saying, look at the beautiful wife that I have. He wasn't trying to praise her and exalt her. He was boastful and bragging. Now, what would she have to do to please people? We don't know. You can conjecture if you want. But in any case, the guy was drunken completely, idol worshipper, which were all the gods of the, uh, the Persia, he was a murderer. He had no problem in giving decree to kill all the Jews in the human race because 10,000 talents were promised him by one of his high princes. No problem at all in taking them life. Very immoral, great big massive harem, a dictator who wanted always his own way. No problems. Dictator. Ruler of a pagan world empire. That's not really the ideal husband that a too beautiful Christian girl would look, look forward to. It would be fearful. It would be fearful. And yet that was what God had prepared for her. We find very plainly she obeyed her marriage vows because an attempt was made upon his life. Mordecai found out and he told Esther about it and straight away she went and told the king to save his life. He died later on through being assassinated. Twelve years after Esther's finished, he was assassinated. So this man wasn't someone who everyone loved Ruthless complete, but he was assassinated. Assassination plan was, was, was made. She found out. She went and told the king. She told him completely. And she didn't attempt to prosper by, his, by the marriage. She could have said very, very plainly, Mordecai is my relative and raised me up. The king would have given him money untold because he can't have his wife being queen and a relative being a poor person. He can't do that. You have to exalt him and raise him up 
and give him some sort of position to make it, le- to make it someone worthy of his, um, as a relative of his, of his wife. She didn't do that. She wanted no physical prosperity from this man whatsoever. No one's ever. She accepted her position, but didn't want to become financially beneficial by it. Then we told also, if that wasn't enough to be the wife of a pagan man living in a pagan home for the rest of her life, then came a decree that all the Jews should be killed. That means she was to be put to death. Now, this was caused by a hatred of his high priest, his, sorry, his high prince, the greatest of his princes, and this prince was not bowed down to by Mordecai, so to get even, he had to kill all of Mordecai's race plus him. Very evil person. He came to the king and said, King, these people aren't worth living your kingdom. I'll give you 10,000 talents if you wipe them all out. Said, okay, go ahead and do it. No problem. No problem. So death decree came upon all the Jews, upon Esther, upon Mordecai. They didn't, didn't realise then it was Esther. It was just, just Mordecai and all the rest. Well, Mordecai told her, said, listen, Esther, you have to go before the king and plead for us. And she said, you don't know what that means. If I go before him unannounced, I could receive death penalty. In uh, chapter 4, verse 15 to 17. Sorry, um, 10 to 14. Um, All the king's servants, she's giving an answer to Mordecai who said to go and uh, plead for the king. All the king's servants and the people of the king's providence do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come under the king into the inner court who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death, except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter that he may live. But I have not been called to come in unto the king these 30 days. So 30 days I haven't even seen his face. And they told, and, and they told to Mordecai Esther's words. And then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then there shall enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place, but thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to this kingdom for such a time as this? And Mordecai told her plainly, you've got no alternative but go to the king because you will be destroyed with all the rest of them. And who knows if this is why God brought you in this position the way it is now. Well, she obeyed him completely and she said, listen, verse 15, Then Esther bade them return, and Mordecai this answer, Go and gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me, and neither eat, neither eat nor drink three days, night nor day. I also, my maidens, will fast likewise, and so will I go in unto the king, which is, not in a, which is not according to the law, and if I perish, I perish. So she went and sought God three days, in fasting and prayer, three days, then she accepted God's will, thinking, well, if I'm going to die because of this, I die. Fine. This is the right thing to do, and so I'm going to go forth and do this. So this is a very, very humbling, fearful thing for her, where things have gone from, from worse to worse to worse after that. We find over here that now we have God showing his hand, and God showing the reason why all this happened toward Esther. So first we find God touched the king's heart to, to uh, honour her, so when she came before the king, people looked at her and straight away death penalty, but the king held out his scepter saying, no death penalty. She came along, I guarantee you, she came along very, very, very humbly, very fearful, on her knees, very fearful, and the king said, now, what do you want, Esther? After half my kingdom, I'll give it to you. All she said was, um, I prepared a feast for you, and Haman, this is the guy who made the decree that all Jews should be killed. Would you please like to come to my feast today? A feast of wine. Not food, wine. A booze party. That's all these guys did back then. And so he said, okay, Haman, let's go. Now, why don't she simply say straight away then and there her problem? I think she was very scared. I think also this was not the timing to do it because God had something else to do before that was to be done. So he comes home to the feast and while they're at the feast over there, say, okay, Esther, what is it you want? And I'll give you up to half my kingdom. He said, well, um, if you really want to answer my request, come back tomorrow to the next feast I'll make for you. And I'll tell you then. Why is she hesitating? She's scared. She is simply a nobody whom they picked off the street 
because of her beauty, made queen. Haman was his chosen prince. Very rich, very powerful, very much important to his kingdom. So this nobody or this somebody, this man, this, this woman, which one do you choose from? So I'm sure she's very fearful thinking, he'll favour her, him, instead of me. Why? Because of who he is. So anyway, she was fearful. Then you find after this, that night, the king couldn't sleep. God kept him awake. And this guy, no matter how much he tried, couldn't sleep. So I got up there, well, had his servants come up, come and read me the chronicles. Read me the stories of what's happened in the past. As he's reading through, he read the part where Mordecai had alerted Esther or had alerted regarding the, the uh, attempted assassination on him, he said, what honour has been done to this man? They said, nothing. He said, oh, who's in the court? Haman. Haman had come along <clears throat> to ask for the, the death of Mordecai. He built a gallows in his home and wanted to kill Mordecai and asked for the, he wanted to come and ask for the death. So the king said, well, bring Haman to me. He said, hey, Haman, he said, what? Uh, I want to honour someone. What should I do? Oh, you beauty. Thinking about himself. Get, get the crown, you're a king, and the royal clothes. I want you to get the royal horse and get the very, very prince and have him parade this person around the city saying, thus shall the king do to the one who, whom desire, the king desires to honour. He said, great, go ahead and get all that stuff and give it to Haman and go, go and parade him around. That really humbled him. And I think Haman started to read the handwriting on the wall. But more, more importantly, the king realised, this man Mordecai saved my life. This man, Mordecai, needs to be honoured. So then we find they come before the king. They have this, the banquet over there. He says, okay, Queenie, what do you want? And she says, all I ask you for is my life and the life of my people because we've been sold to be put to death. And the king got furious. Someone sold my wife and these people get killed? Who is this person? And she pointed him out, this wicked Haman over here. Well, the king got so, so angry, his visage started to change. He got up to compose himself. He went outside. <sighs> Composed himself, went outside. Very, very, very super angry. God turned his heart against his high prince to this woman off the street who became his wife. When he comes back, he finds Haman over there on his knees on the bed next to Esther. And the king said, is he going to try and force my wife now? At his command, they put, a, put a, something over his head. They covered his head so he wouldn't have to see his face anymore. Then one of his chamberlains had said, who was, I think, favoured Esther, Haman had built a gallows in his house to kill Mordecai, the man who spoke well for you. He couldn't hang him on him. So they hung up Haman straight away. Then what happens after this? We find this is all God's hand, people. This is all God's hand. And straight away we find after this, Mordecai has been raised up in high official, all of Haman's property has been given to Esther. And then there's a decree made that when the Jews on the certain day they're supposed to be destroyed can defend themselves, Mordecai becomes so, so great, many of the people in his kingdom became Jews for fear of Mordecai. And many people then defended the Jews. So when the day finally came that Jews were to be slain, they killed over 75,000 of their enemies and in Shushan the palace. In two days they killed 800 people. Then we find over in this situation that Esther was used by God to save her people completely, and not just that, but to put a godly man in parliament like Daniel had in the, in the uh, reigns of, uh, of uh, Babylon and the uh, reigns of the early part of the Persian Empire. All this, you think, well, this was a life of hardship that Esther, Esther faced and didn't know why. It's just like Job going through all that suffering and suffering and suffering and uh, losing his children, losing his property, and all those, those, those months of pain and pain, so that God can defeat Satan. And he didn't even know about it. We find Esther, all the hardships she had, the whole purpose, so she could be the saviour of her people. Like Joseph, his imprisonment and his slavery, he could be the saviour of his people. We don't know why God takes us through hardship. We don't know. And we don't um, bring on our circumstances and uh, we, 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 we're told simply to uh, submit to them and accept them. But God has a purpose. And his purpose is realised if we remain obedient to the Lord. That's our part. All the way she was obedient. 
obedient to her cousin, obedient to her husband, obedient to God, completely obedient all the time. Never, ever, ever tried to push herself forward, never tried to exalt herself because of her position as queen. No. She maintained faithful. Imagine, even now after all this was done, she remains a queen in a pagan home. No Christian music, no Christian lifestyle, no Christian people around about, all ungodly, all pagan. Statues everywhere, idols everywhere. Her husband was a very ruthless person, going with wars after wars after wars. She's back over there, nice and proper. He got assassinated, like I mentioned before you, at the end of Esther, eight years later he was assassinated. What happened to her then? Was she assassinated too? Was she killed with her husband? We don't know. We don't know. But God raised her up in these difficult circumstances and despite the hardships, she ended up in great victory because of her obedience. So we don't govern our circumstances, but we can make use of our circumstances through life of obedience. That's all it takes. That's why I love this passage so, so much. The ending is so good. From a time of woe, a time of celebration. And it wasn't some great, mighty David warrior. A simple girl, an orphan with nothing, nothing on her side but the beauty that God gave her. That's all. Now, I praise God for that. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine understanding in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. That is a, a, a theme of life. No matter what you find yourself in, trust in God with all your heart and your situation in life might not be so good. It might not be what you desire. Might not be what you planned, but it's what you're stuck with. Fine. God knows about it. God allow it. As for his glory, I'll accept it. Let's bow for prayer. Thank you, loving Father, for what you teach us in your word so many times, the wonderful, wonderful lessons we have. And thank you for those faithful saints of the past that endured such hardship, Lord, purely, purely, purely to show forth thy grace and bring forth thy will. Give us the grace, Lord, to join these wonderful, wonderful uh, heroes in the past and be like them, Lord, in our life today, whereby everything we do will be done for your glory. In Christ, and we'll thank you and pray. Amen.